early in my ministry, in my very first district, fresh out of seminary, uh, it seemed that I had an unusual constellation of funerals. You know, I kept thinking they didn't prepare me for this in seminary. Uh, and some of them were old people, you know, people as old as I am now. <laughs> uh, some of them were old people who had lived long and well. Uh, and, the, and the grief was, was not so difficult to, to handle and to hold. But I, I remember uh, uh, several others that were these stark, horrific human tragedies. And one that was uh, fell into that category was a 18 year old young man whose mother was a brand new Adventist committed suicide. And I was asked to do the service. Actually, there were two services. There was a Catholic service for the rest of the mother's family. And then there was an Adventist service because she was now an Adventist. It was interesting to me, the Catholic service was first and I went to it and I listened to the priest do what good priests, in my opinion, always do. He mined the resources of their faith. Some of it was a little far-fetched if I understand Catholic dogma right, didn't matter. He mined the resources of his faith to offer some message of hope. And then when it was my turn, I did the same thing. You know, I, I looked for some words that would offer hope. Mothers need hope. Dads probably do too. But I have heard the haunting cry from mothers more often than from, from fathers. What about my kid? What about my son? What about my daughter? Um, just, just a few weeks ago, I picked up the phone and called somebody from my childhood that uh, I should have stayed a little bit more in touch with. Um, but I picked up the phone and called her just to say hi. And she began to talk to me about her son who had died not that long before. And how, according to all church dogma that she knew, he was lost. But her heart couldn't agree with that. And, um, you know, so she was stuck, it felt to her like, either believing her heart or believing her religion. That's a terrible place to be, especially if you're a mother or a father. That's kind of the background of what I wanna uh, present here today. Um, as a pastor, over and over again, I would hear people ask, but what about my children? Um, and as Lauren mentioned, oh, I'll add to this. So the, the second mother, the, the person from my childhood, her son was not an exemplary model citizen. He had been troubled from childhood. He was a foster child. His life was always full of trouble, trouble that bothered him and not infrequently trouble that bothered other people too. He was a difficult person. He had died of an overdose. Mom wanted to believe it was accidental, but what do you say? How do we find hope? Our heart insists that there is hope, but often we think that our religion requires us to, to speak the truth, which is there's no hope. So that's the background. Um, and I, I wanna begin then with um, reading a poem. The title is, um, You Go On to Heaven, I Think I'll Stay. Oh, maybe one more word of background. Maury Vinden was a powerful influence on, my, on me, a good influence. He, 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 he was wonderful help for me. Uh, but you know, most of us can't find anybody in the world we agree with on everything. And I remember one thing that I heard him reference more than once, that the older I got, you know, when I was young, I thought, wow, that's deep, that's profound. And the older I got, I'm going, no, that's wrong. He remembered telling, I can't remember whether it was an uncle or his father or a grandfather, but there was a family gathering, you know, like at one of the holidays. And an old minister in the family 
at that time, Yomori was a young person. Uh, the old minister was telling the family, you know what, folks? I'm going to heaven. I'm going to see Jesus. Um, I hope you guys decide to come, but whether you come or not, I'm going to see Jesus and it's going to be so good. And Maury celebrated the fact that here was somebody who was so in love with Jesus that all these other human connections just fell away into insignificance. I dissent from that view. And here's the poem. You go on to heaven, I think I'll stay. It was nice of you to ask me to come with you to heaven. You told me all about it, that everyone should go. How heaven was a lovely place where we'd chase our highest dreams and taste our richest pleasures. In your heaven, we'd bask in eternal light and quaff eternal joy. We'd fellowship with Jesus and talk for hours with God. It sounded really nice and all. I nearly bought a ticket, but then you said that other thing, and I decided not to go. The ticket to your heaven was not hard to come by. The only thing I had to do was believe that I was damned and all those other people too. And Jesus saved me by his death, if only I believed and said the words. Oh, and one more thing you said, I couldn't bring my kids. My kids. My girl who works in South Seattle with homeless crazy people she would be offended to know that I told you they were crazy. My boy, the ER doc who loves to rescue people, beloved by all the nurses and the CNAs and the texts and by his kids and by his wife. The daughter helping refugees, Iraqis and Somalis and says that they are family and calls the women auntie and all the old men uncle and hugs the kids like cousins. The one who makes my music and helps my old heart dance. The one who's doing science, chasing tiny mysteries and pondering the grandest questions. And the two raising Wancho, the special child, the special needs born a continent away. You said I couldn't bring them. They'd have to come themselves with a ticket they themselves acquired by saying the precious words. But they won't. You see, my girl, the social worker one, she loves those crazy people, the addicts and the addled ones who live in the halfway house she runs. Even when they drive her crazy or kill themselves or make trouble for their neighbors, she will not say their lack of faith will keep them out of heaven. Most of them will never say the needed magic words, so they can't come, and she won't go without them. My doctor son, who nearly died of COVID, who took theology in college before giving up the faith, you say the rules won't let me bring him. He has to say the words. My daughter saving refugees from countries full of mosques. She stubbornly refuses to damn them for their error, which makes her quite complicit in their lack of Christian faith and shows that she herself is lacking in the requisite conviction that all are justly damned without the words of Jesus, Jesus only. Then there's the kids whose outdoor wedding I performed a while ago, whose parents taught in Advent schools for 30 years or more. The kids themselves heard all the stories about Adam and Eve and Noah. They learned the facts about the fall and sin, about faith and hope and love, but in the end, kept only love. And their families call them atheists. Still, they ask a preacher to officiate their wedding to pray and preach because their moms would like it, and the dads too. I think your lovely heaven would be an even better place if I brought these kids along, but you said I couldn't bring them. They haven't said the words. And my kids making music and chasing cures in their lab 
and writing code and rearing children. You said there is no family plan. Your heaven welcomes just a special few. People like me who know and say the magic words and agree to damn the rest. But I won't. Thanks for the invitation. I think your heaven's really nice. I'm sure that you will like it. The bliss and light, Jesus and angels and all the believers. I'm sure you'll really like them. You'll be happy there. But you go on without me. I think I'll stay. Let's go to a to some biblical exposition. I love the title I came up with. Lauren scolded me a bit saying, John, you know, that's a clever title, but we've got to tell people what you're actually going to talk about. <laughs> I love that. So mother of mother or mothers of Solomon and father or fathers of Jesus. The singular and plural in both cases work saying different things. Now, my guess is if you well, I'll just my guess is that when we hear mother of Solomon, most of us would think Bathsheba. That's not the mother I'm talking about, at least not in the first place. It's the other mother in Solomon's tale that I'm thinking about. Most of you having are quite biblically literate and you'll know the story, but forgive me, let me just tell the story. Solomon is a young king. I mean, he's, he's still green behind the ears, wet behind the ears. Two women come to him. You know, one drags the other one into court. And they, they, they're standing there crying and hollering and shouting. The women are prostitutes. Uh, you know, regarded by Solomon, if we take the Proverbs as an example, these are lowlifes. These are subversive of virtuous society. These are bad people. Still, it's his job as king to render judgment. The first woman says, I, me and this other lady, we share a house. We both had babies during the night. She must have rolled over on her baby and killed it. And she switched the babies. And when I woke up in the morning, the dead baby that was in my arms was not my baby. She took my baby. And the other one is shouting back, no, 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 no. No, the living child is mine. You, you killed your baby. Your baby died. No, this one's mine. Solomon listens to the women arguing back and forth for a little bit. And then finally says, wait, wait, stop, stop. Okay, so you say the living baby is yours and the dead baby is hers. And you say the living baby is yours and the dead baby is hers. I mean, what can we do? How, how do we adjudicate this? Ah, I know. Hey, bring me a sword. So they bring the sword in and then he says, okay, let's cut the living baby in half and the dead baby in half. And we'll give half of each child to each woman. They'll each have a whole baby. And one of the women immediately says, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Let her have the living child. And Solomon says, okay, give her the baby. She's the mother. And the Bible says that as Israel heard the verdict, the whole nation cheers because they're going, our king is wise. When we say someone is wise, we actually say they think the way we do. We say they may say it better. They may see it more clearly, but, but we agree with them. That's what, how we know they're wise. And the nation hearing the king's decision, they go, yes, that's how mothers are. Of course, that's, that is a perfect solution to the, to the case. Now, with our modern sensitivities, in certain circles, I could imagine somebody immediately saying, oh, wait, 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 wait. I know about mothers who don't fit that beautiful maternal stereotype. Yes, of course, I do too. In the course of my 
career, I, I, I listened to horrendous stories of maternal failure, and I won't go farther. But those stories do not erase, they don't, they don't diminish the powerful stereotype of the glorious nature of being a mother. So Solomon establishes justice based on his view of how mothers are. And now if I wanna link it with Bathsheba for just a minute, I would argue that the fact that Solomon assumes this about women means that he had a normal childhood, that in his childhood, mother was somebody who provided for him, somebody who thought he was the very best, somebody, she, she did the stereotypical, beautiful maternal things. Now I wanna to go to the New Testament, to Jesus. I wanna talk about the father of Jesus, now meaning Joseph, and then we'll talk well. And the reason I can talk about the father of Jesus is because of the way Jesus spoke about fathers, plural. We don't have any stories about Joseph and Jesus interacting, but it's interesting. In the Synoptic Gospels, there's quite a few references to God as father. And in every case, with I think two exceptions, in every case, when Jesus references God as father, it is always in the sense of a protector, a provider, somebody who bends toward you. It's the daddy in the story of the prodigal son. But everywhere that Jesus speaks of God as father, it, it is a word of reassurance. Let's, let's read a few of the passages that uh, we have there. Let me get back to that. Oh, come on. There we go. Again, assuming that most of the audience here is biblically literate, I'm going to run through fairly quickly, but I do want to read some of these words. Right, right at the beginning, the uh, Beatitudes. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called the children of God. And clearly what he's saying is God is a peacemaker. So act like God. Act like your daddy. Um, these are all from the Sermon on the Mount. I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. That way you'll be acting as true children of your father in heaven, for he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and unjust alike. Notice the picture of father. When you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Here's how you pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Notice the emotional tone in every one of these references to God is father further down in chapter six look at the birds they don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them and aren't you far more valuable to him than they are further in chapter six if god cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow he will certainly care for you why do you have so little faith so don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink or what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? When Jesus wanted to reference a metaphor for God as an authority figure, he did not use father. He used other ones, king, judge, uh, officer. 
but father for Jesus was the stereotypical daddy, a protector, a provider, somebody who knew your needs. And the clear implication of this is he knows your needs and anticipates and provides for them. When we give sustained attention to this character of God, it will change our religious life, our spiritual life anyway, maybe not our religious life. It will change our spiritual life. A bit more than 15 years ago, I, I radically altered my devotional practice. You know, from high school on, I'd always had my Bible reading time as a daily practice. But about 15 years ago, I quit that. And I went outside and sat on a stool um, before dawn and spent a while in contemplation, watching the sky and in my mind, watching my parishioners and praying for them. I mean, these were separate things. I would, I would spend a while simply in quiet contemplation of the loveliness that was there. And then a while in coming to my church members and holding them in my heart and loving on them as I sat there. The ordinary, it seemed, well, what I grew up with when I thought of intercessory prayer, thought of myself as the petitioner, and I'm asking Almighty God who can do anything that he wants. And so I thought of intercessory prayer, I'm going to pray for you because you have a problem. And I remember very early in this, uh, in this um, practice, I'm sitting outside, um, I'm holding a couple that are in my church, you know, in my heart. And go, God help these people. And then it occurred to me, I'm going, okay, so let's imagine that God put me in charge. You know, he gave me divine power and I was going to fix the situation. And I began to realize the uh, dilemma that God faces because these two people were so hopelessly mismatched that the only way for there to have been harmony would have been to completely remake one or the other or both of them, basically destroying who they were and then creating new people. The, I saw absolutely no way with all the power in the universe that you could make the people as they were into tranquil, happy partners. And I began to change. I no longer saw myself sitting at the foot of God's throne looking at God, begging God to do something, I was now sitting beside God, looking at his world with him, loving his people with him, and shaking my head, and wringing my hands, and crying a little bit at the pain that his children are involved in. And the longer over the years, as I spent time looking at humanity that way, the notion that somehow salvation had anything to do with a reluctance on God's part, it, it became, it just was unthinkable. Now, one more story. I remember some years ago, a woman called me up, asked if I could meet her at Starbucks. Okay, so yes, of course, I'll meet her at Starbucks. So she sits down and I've been trying to think, what on the earth does she wanna to talk to me about? You know, is there trouble in her church? She had been a member of my church. She had left with a group from my church because I was too liberal. And, and they were correct in their assessment of the views that they found unacceptable. So, you know, they, they had not distorted my views. My views and their views were significantly different. They had left uh, amicably, but they needed to go someplace where they felt more comfortable. So they'd gone to this other church. And so when she sits down in Starbucks, she says, you know, I left your church because you were too liberal, but now I need a liberal pastor and you're the only one I know. <laughs> um, and she begins to talk to me about her son, whom I had known. He, he went to school with my kids, uh, had been lots of trouble, lots and lots of trouble. He had recently told his mom that he was no longer he, but he was she. And the church she was now attending insisted that she kick him out of the house and let him live under a bridge. And her brother, who was an Adventist minister, had told her that he was praying that 
her son slash daughter would die soon so that uh, it would uh, end the, the problem. It was interesting to me to listen to her. It was very clear she was surrounded by a, an entire church community that wanted to figuratively stone this young person to death. And she was adamant that she was not going to kick him or her out. She was not going to separate. She was not going to withdraw support. She was not going to withdraw affection. Her question was, but what would God do? Was God going to let him, her into heaven? We talked for a while and finally I said to her, I go, you know, over the last hour as we've been talking, I have noticed that you have consistently referred to your child as my child. So you're surrounded by family and church members wanting to say, cut them off, throw them out. And you said, no, they're mine. I said, do you really think you're nicer than God? You will risk your social connections at every level because you're gonna save your child, but you don't think God will? Listen to your heart, mom. I don't think you're nicer than God. Over and over again, when I listen to people talk about their children, they hang on to their children. They love their children. They will tell me their children's good points. The mom that I referenced earlier from my childhood friend, um, whose son was born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. She was telling me of evidences of a turning toward home in the last months of his life and going, surely those count for something, right? Her heart could see the goodness or the potential for goodness, but her religion, as she understood it, could not. I'm arguing that if we take the biblical metaphor for God, Father, and of course, as, you know, as modern people, we instinctively and immediately make that parent. So now we're pulling in the, the virtues of, God, of fathers and mothers in their ideal state. If that is the fundamental picture of God, then the notion that somehow, you know, the gospel of John, those who believe are saved and those who don't believe are condemned already and damned forever. We just go, yeah, but that was, that was, that's not right. We end up correcting scripture because our hearts know better. And we correct scripture, and I wanna be clear here, we correct scripture using scripture. Everybody picks their normative text and then explains that the ones that don't agree uh, don't mean what they really say. This, this happens all over theology. The reason there's theological debates is because the Bible itself is ambiguous in many, many places. So once you pick a normative text and you want to develop a systematic theology, you then explain why those other texts don't really mean what they say. So for me, I take as normative the picture of God that Jesus paints by using the word Father. And I insist that that is, well, I'll, I'll, let me back up. I simply say that is my view of Father. I know that it's heretical. And in this case, heretic is simply a descriptive word. It means an individual who has views that are not approved by the formal voices of authority within an ecclesiastical community. So I'm a heretic in this area. I happen to know that there's a whole lot of heretics with me. And the vast majority of people that I know are heretics if they listen to their hearts. And I'm gonna argue that that's a good thing to do. Now I'm gonna once more read the poem and then we'll open it for discussion. It was nice of you to ask me to come with you to heaven. You told me all about it, that everyone should go. How heaven was a lovely place where we chase our highest dreams and taste our richest pleasures. In your heaven, we'd bask in everlasting light and quaff eternal joy. We'd fellowship with Jesus 
and talk for hours with God. It sounded really nice and all. I nearly bought a ticket. But then you said that other thing. And I decided not to go. The ticket to your heaven was not hard to come by. The only thing I had to do was believe that I was damned and all those other people too. And Jesus saved me by his death. If only I believed and said the words. Oh, and one more thing you said, I couldn't bring my kids. My kids, the girl who works in South Seattle with homeless, crazy people, she would be annoyed to know I told you they were crazy. My boy, the ER doc, who loves to rescue people, beloved by all the nurses and the CNAs and texts, and by his wife and by his kids. The daughter helping refugees, Somalis and Iraqis, and says that they are family and calls all the women auntie and all the old men uncle and hugs the kids like cousins. The one who makes my music, helps my old heart dance. The one who's doing science, chasing tiny mysteries and pondering the grandest questions. And the two raising Wancho, the special child with special needs born a continent away. You said I couldn't bring them. They'd have to come themselves with the ticket they themselves acquired by saying the precious words, but they won't. You see, my girl, the social worker one, she loves those crazy people, the addicts and the addled ones in the halfway house she runs. Even when they drive her crazy or kill themselves or make trouble for their neighbors, she will not say their lack of faith will keep them out of heaven. Most of them will never say the needed magic words so they can't come and she will not go without them. My doctor son, who nearly died of COVID, who took theology in college before giving up his faith. You say the rules won't let me bring him. He has to say the words. My daughter saving refugees from countries full of mosques, she stubbornly refuses to damn them for their error which makes her quite complicit in their lack of Christian faith and shows that she herself is lacking in the requisite conviction that all are justly damned without the words of Jesus, Jesus only. The kids whose wedding, whose outdoor wedding I performed a while ago, whose parents taught in Advent schools for 30 years or more, the kids themselves heard all the stories about Adam and Eve and Noah. They learned the facts about the fall and sin, about faith and hope and love, but in the end, kept only love. And their families call them atheists. Still, they ask a preacher to officiate their wedding, to pray and preach because their moms would like it, and the dads too. I think your lovely heaven would be even better if I brought those kids along. But you said I couldn't bring them. They haven't said the words. And my kids making music and chasing cures in their lab and writing code and rearing children. You said there's no family plan. Your heaven welcomes just a special few. People like me who know and say the magic words and agree to damn the rest. But I won't. Thanks for the invitation. I think your heaven's really nice. And I'm sure that you will like it. The bliss and light, Jesus and angels and all the believers. I'm sure you will really like them. You'll be happy there. But you go on without me. I think I'll stay. Yeah, this is lovely. And thank you so much, John. I really appreciate it. The, this topic touches me a great deal because not only do I have loved ones who I can worry about, but uh, John, truth of the matter is some of us ourselves have questions about our own assurance of salvation. Am I right? Yes. 
and I'm going to use that to, as an excuse to remember something I forgot to include. Uh, go just, ahead. Yeah, just what? Um, was it this? Yeah, I think it was this week. Early, early this past week, uh, one of my good buddies called. Um, he's a retired minister, a few years older than I am. I used to tell people when he, he was still in ministry, if I could be a different minister, I would be him. I mean, I just, yeah, I really like this guy. He's, it seems to me he's got a magic way. I watch him interact with people and I'm just going, wow, that, that's, that's way cool. And he's uh, a much better administrator than I am too. Um, he, he has a keen interest in ethics. At one point was working on a PhD in ethics. And we just, Monday, when, when we talked, we were saying, John, you know, I'm, I'm reading the Bible and I, I keep coming away wondering, do I do right because it's right? Or do I simply do right because somebody's watching me? You know, I, I don't want the principle, you know, I don't want to get in trouble with a principal. Now I'm saying that those weren't his words, but it was, you know, so he's looking at himself and he's going, I don't have pure motives. When I do the right thing, it's, it's not from, from absolutely virtuous, noble motives. And I started laughing. I go, Tom, Tom, quit, quit, stop it. I said, so what are you going to do? Let's agree your motives are not completely pure. So now what are you going to do? Go be a jerk? <laughs> he goes, no, 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 I wasn't planning to do that. I'm going, of course not. And then I said, Tom, um, my, I'm, I'm at my, at that point, I was at my daughter's house. I said, my granddaughter is cuter than yours. And of course he goes, well, now I know you're lying. Um, I mean, I, I'm enough of an ethicist to know that you're, you're flat out lying now. Uh, you know, we, we bantered back and forth and then go, Tom, you are somebody's grandson. And I think one of the things we can do in contemplation that can help set our own hearts at rest is to go back and forth between being grandfathers, watching our grandkids who are the cutest, smartest, brightest, most promising homo sapiens in the universe. And then remember that we are grandchildren and we are the smartest, brightest, most promising homo sapiens in the universe. And to be deliberate and habitual in seeing ourselves through the eyes that we ourselves use when we look at our children, our grandchildren. And obviously in the poem, you know, as I'm talking about my children, these are not my biological children. But all of us know young people that you know own a piece of our heart, and and that's who I'm talking about. These people that own my heart, as I will not let them go, and I won't, and I will not damn them. The older I get, I'm going. Well, you know, I'm not nicer than God. That would be the way God is with me. He's bragging to somebody about me, and he's overlooking the stuff he can't brag about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because when you talk about your grandkids, now, okay, there are real problems. There's real human brokenness. But so much of this anxiety is rooted in the ordinary realm of human experience. And I think if we look at the ordinary realm of human experience and then take the gravy off, the, the cream off the top, take the best, that's, that's where we can live with our kids, our grandkids, and with ourselves. Uh, John, before I turn off the recording, I, I want to just pursue a couple of things with you. And I, we have two hands up. I hope Cherry Ann and Lois will wait for just a moment. You and I talked the other day about this matter of security of salvation. And uh, I don't know how you were raised. I, I certainly wasn't raised with any sense that God was sure to save me. I was raised feeling that I was moment by moment on the razor's edge of being lost. And it was a painful way to grow up. I always said when I became a pastor, 
uh, that my theme pat text would be, you may know you have eternal life. And I, I used it a lot and tried to explain to people that no, we are not living constantly uh, not knowing what's the point of living for God if, if God can never give you any assurance. And you know as well as I do, John, that uh, a lot of that was drawn from Ellen White, uh, that notion that we can't feel certain about salvation. Uh, but when I talked to you about it the other day, you said, uh, you said, when I talk about the assurance of salvation, I'm not talking about it in those sort of evangelical terms. I'm talking about it in a sort of different way. And I thought what you said was very important to me. And I, I, I wonder if you would mind going into that a little bit for, for our presentation before I bring Terry Ann and Lois in. Yes, of course. Um, first, I want to emphasize, and, and I think I think this, well, let me just make my statement. We think of this as an Adventist problem. And we look to Ellen White, and it is clear, Ellen White feeds it. If you read the book, Steps to Christ, which we talk, oh, so finally, here's the book, you know, where, where grace shows up. And, you know, this, the book, Steps to Christ, never makes an unqualified statement of grace or assurance. Every place where she begins to talk about assurance before she finishes the paragraph, she will include the word or the meaning, whether she actually uses the word if. You know, all of heaven is working on your behalf and we can have this assurance if. It, it, everyone, and I think many of you know that when the book Steps to Christ was first published, the first chapter, uh, about the love of God was not part of the book. It began with the sinner's need of Christ, the classic reformed, dark, gloomy, pessimistic picture of human nature. That's where the book began, and, and the first chapter was not part of the book. Um, and then um, at the insistence of some publishers, that chapter was added. Raises an interesting question about inspiration, doesn't it? But it's important for us to understand that Ellen White's, the legalism that we, we, we see in Ellen White, she did not invent that. That was classic Protestant legalism of the day. Holiness religions, you know, holiness Pentecostals, conservative evangelicals live within a huge amount of anxiety. I remember reading a book by a guy who went to Liberty University. And you know he was not a theologian <laughs> at all. You know he's a kid, and he came from I can't remember. I think an atheist. I don't know if he was an atheist. Anyway, he didn't have much of a religious background. So he's just reporting on what he sees. The thing that jumped out. One of the things that jumped out at me from that book. Here you're at Liberty University. Obviously, the very bastion of once saved, always saved. These kids. These are all good Christian kids. They gave their heart to Jesus when they were in kindergarten or juniors or. And this guy writes about the fact that at every meeting where there were calls for people to surrender, huge numbers of students would come forward and they would do it over and over and over again. The huge percentages of the students worried that they were damned. So this is not an Adventist problem. And I would argue it is a problem when you make Paul the center of your theology. You know, you, you notice I didn't, I didn't try to use any of the, the legal forensic. I didn't use all the, any of that kind of stuff. That's a different kind of theology. It has its place. But when we make Paul normative, and that that's the, that's the filter through which we have to get Christianity, well, Paul begins with the damnation of all because he begins with his own experience. He was a professional Christian killer. And that's going to warp your view of salvation and God and all kinds of things. God's grace found him and he became a, a spokesperson of grace understood that way. But that does not fit human experience across the board. And when you try to take Paul's language, I am a chief of sinners. And then you're, you're talking to a mother who has been caring for her special needs kid for the last 
40 years and the greatest fear of her life is that nobody's gonna be there to take care of him when she dies. And then you want her to say, well, but I'm the chief of sinners. Okay, it just doesn't work. It, it, it. And so for me at this point, I simply dismiss all of that negative reformed theology perspective on human nature. Now, I wanna be clear. I recognize that evil is real, real <laughs> that humans are capable of horrific evil. Yes, that is true. Humans are also capable of marvelous goodness. Both are inherent in our humanity. And fortunately, most of the time, people are doing pretty much as good as they can, to quote a friend of mine. And God as father or grandfather or mother or grandmother is quite pleased to call us his own. I agree with you. I've said it many times. I um, try to, to remind my churches of this and to remind other pastors of this very phrase that you said, everybody is doing about as well as they can at any given moment. And the best thing that we can do is to be understanding of that fact. This was from an essay that you may have, have uh, read. A dear friend of mine, deeply sincere and godly Adventist, told me that his son had confessed to him that he was no longer a church member, but an atheist. My son is a good man, he told me, a kind and wonderful father, son and husband. I have accepted that I will not be spending eternity with him. I found that heartbreaking. Fortunately, I don't believe it, and I wish I could convince him to doubt it too. In the world in which we have landed, it's hard to believe in God. And one article of my personal faith is that God has to understand that, or he's not a God I'd want to be in heaven with. There are multiple reasons why one may reject a belief in God, and even more reasons to reject the traditional notions advanced by misinformed Christians. Perhaps this unbeliever is an analytical thinker who can't score the claims of science for the claims of the Bible. Perhaps he was given a wrong picture of God when he can't accept and is unable to see God differently. Perhaps he was exposed to a kind of spiritual manipulation that is so common in religious organizations. Perhaps the sin and suffering of the world hurts him too deeply and he is unable to discern a benevolent deity behind it. Perhaps he hasn't the emotional makeup to feel God's an invisible presence in a relationship, which is how many Christians confirm their belief in God. I have to believe, if I'm to believe in God at all, that God understands and takes into account all of that. After all, if you and I can understand why people are as they are, why can't God? Why would God throw under the bus a completely honest, searching good man who, because of experiences and personality traits outside of his control, can't accept the kind of God that is meaningful to you and me. And uh, John, that's, I think what, I think you and I are on the same page on that. I, I, I hope so, because that's truly what I believe. I, I don't know if, if you want to call it universalism, universalism or what you want to call it, but um, there it is. What strikes me, uh, well, um, oh, two weeks ago, I uh, was driving from somewhere to Walla Walla and somebody uh, that I know needed a ride, uh, a, a woman about my age. So she's a conventional, uncomplicated, good Adventist. And, you know, hours into our trip, at some point she, she kind of, my, my sense was she was getting up the courage to admit that she thought that heaven had room for a lot of people that it used to be she didn't think it had room for. And part of it, it came out of some work she had done with a social service, a social service agency where she watched people dealing with the, the mess of life, the, the difficulties of life that, that she and I have, have no direct experience. And at some point I, Anyway, I reflected back there and went, well, it sounds to me like you really are, you know, you're pretty close to being a universalist. And she, it's kind of like she, she you know, it's kind of like you look around and see who's, who's, you know, is anybody hearing this? And goes, yeah, you know, that, yeah, that's kind of where I am. And my sense is that that's where almost all of it, well, my experience as a pastor, unlike a lot of people, I have directly, personally, experienced very little of the 
the egregious dysfunction that I often used to hear about when I was the editor at Adventist Today. You know, so it seemed to me that most of the church people, they were good people and they were loving people. And so their instincts are to include everybody. And they only exclude people if they feel like they gotta. And uh, so that was why I did the biblical piece that I did as I'm going, if your heart says, I want to include people, I can provide you biblical support for your heart. The other is also true. If you want to exclude people, there are certainly biblical passages to support that. And uh, I'm not gonna give them to you, but I will admit they are there. <laughs> Thank you, John, so much. Um, this was been, this has just been superb, John, and uh, it makes me realize I want to spend a whole lot more time talking with you, and we're going to have you back as one of our teachers. Thank you for all of you for being here. It's four o'clock. I hope you found this as much of a blessing as I did. And we are going to move on from here and let you go all. Those of you who are in my time zone are going to have a little supper and those of you in uh, Europe are going to go to bed, and uh, we're going to we're going to move on. And John, um, I'm going to stop the recording now, and we, and you and I are going to keep talking, and uh, we'll see if we can uh, line you up for another class. Uh, thank you all of you who participated. It was a wonderful. I, I kind of wish I had gotten everything that you said, but of course we have to be a little careful about uh, recording some things. Uh, that people say, but we will have your main presentation and the ending here up on our web uh, on our YouTube channel. So everybody, please look at our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to it, if you will, please. We're trying to get more subscriptions on our YouTube channel right now. Easy enough to find. Just go to YouTube and put in Adventist Today, and it'll bring it right up to the top. Goodbye, everybody. God bless you.